Hope everybody's doing okay today. I may get too loud for this new sound system. Uh, I may get too loud anyway. Uh, but we're glad everybody's here today. We appreciate the work that uh, everybody's doing on kind of taking us into the modern age in terms of our technology, and so we'll see where that's going to continue to go. Uh, we're glad, Bruce, you're here today. We miss your smiling face. Hope you're doing well. Dick, we're glad you're here today. Uh, I hope you all know Scrappy more. And if you don't know Scrappy, you need to get back there and get to know Scrappy. Uh, Scrappy's one of the favorite people that I've met in this town. Uh, good Lord, 50 years that I have been here. And uh, I'm, one of the books that I'm most proud of having had a chance to write was the book that I wrote about Scrappy's dad. And I could never have done that had it not been without Scrappy. And so, Scrappy, we're glad you're here today. We're glad you're up and around. That gives us all hope. <laughs> so thank you for coming. And if you all have not seen the newspaper that's back on the table over here on the, on the side, be sure to go by there and see it and look at Charles Pierce and his Best Dressed Award from 1996. <laughs> Your imaginations will probably only be confirmed when you see the picture. But I did not proudly. bring it in either. Uh, I have challenged Charles to wear that outfit next week. It might be a little cool, maybe. It might be a little cool. If it's like me from 1996, it might be a little tight. <laughs> well, that probably also would be true on you. <laughs> I'm sure it would be true on me. Uh, so, Dennis, you enjoyed your your time of retirement. <laughs> Bishop and I were talking about retirement coming in here. Some people are able to do that, so maybe you can help me and the bishop after you figure all that out, or maybe you'll fall back into other habits. You're going to have to stick with me a little bit this morning, okay? Don't anybody get up and leave, because this isn't going to go the direction that it sounds like it's first. It's going to go a very different direction. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of stuff up here today, so we'll see where this goes. Uh, in, in the uh, 1880s, which actually does get back before any of us were born, uh, there was a need among Protestants in America, uh, and Protestantism was growing rapidly in America by the end of the 1800s, to have some kind of a document that would kind of ground the ideas of this emerging Protestantism that actually was finally kind of reaching beyond the Catholicism that had dominated America. And so you had published in the 1880s a magazine basically called The Christian Century. And, and The Christian Century has become, over all of these years, uh, one of the most excellent pieces of writing that uh, I've ever, ever experienced. Uh, I, I can remember back uh, many years ago in the night, late eight, uh, 1980s that I had an article published in Christian Century, and, and I thought, you know, I'd ride. That's about as high as you can go. And, and I kind of still feel like that. Uh, in a way, and I'm glad, and glad about that. And so the Christian century had been for decades upon decades uh, the magazine that kind of was where Protestant ideas and Protestant thought was carried forward in, in the United States. By the time that we became uh, aware of life, and let's say in the post-World War II period of time, uh, you, you know that you've got the advent of what we loosely call evangelical uh, Protestantism in America. Um, and I think most of us were part of that. Most of us grew up going to revivals or new people that did. Most of us grew up, grew up in churches that had an evangelical kind of force to them as far as religion was concerned. And, and clearly that was the time when, when Billy Graham captured all of our attention. Uh, I, I can't recall a Billy Graham rally on television that 
my mother didn't gather me and all my brothers and my father and make sure we watched it from beginning to end. I, I, I can sing parts on all verses of Just As I Am. I've been doing that for a long, long uh, time. <clears throat> and, and I will tell you that uh, I, I have huge admiration for Billy Graham. Uh, I think Billy Graham was a tremendous preacher. I think Billy Graham was a man of huge character. Uh, in the work that I've done with the part of the Billy Graham organization called Samaritan's Purse, the people that I've known that were there when Billy Graham was at his uh, most alive, uh, I mean, their lives were just touched by this man. And, and I feel like mine was, and, and I'll bet many of you all feel uh, the same way. So I have great admiration for Billy Graham. Billy Graham felt in 1956 that there was enough of a movement of the evangelical end of Christianity that, that they needed their magazine, something that would be like the Christian century. Not to compete with it or not to be against it, but to kind of move along with directions that American faith were moving in. And so in 1956, Billy Graham founded the Christian century. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, Christianity Today, Christianity Today, Christianity Today, okay? Uh, and, and so that magazine has been out there uh, in lots of church libraries, subscribed to by lots of preachers, and has been very important in uh, the history of, of modern American uh, Christianity. It was uh, an article from that magazine that Jim Morrell gave me that kind of was the spark for, for this particular lesson. Um, and so uh, Jim uh, sent me an article in which Christian Century had in, in included some writing about the impeachment of President Trump. And again, that's not the direction this lesson's going in, so you can sit back and relax. But, but th that article was there. I, I was aware of that article. I bet many of you all were too. I probably would have read it, but I hadn't. And so I really appreciated that Jim sent it to me so I would have the opportunity to read it. And so I read the article. I'm not going to comment on it. You can read it for yourself. Uh, however, uh, Jim bringing this to my attention made me aware of somebody that I have not really been greatly aware of, a man by the name of Mark Galley. I'll tell you a little bit about Mark. Uh, Mark uh, uh, came from the Midwest. He took his faith in God very seriously from the time of his youth. He gave his life in full-time Christian service to the Christian ministry. He served for 10 years as a Presbyterian minister, uh, both in the United States uh, and in a foreign mission field. And I, I don't know what you all think about foreign missionaries, but the people that I know that have been foreign missionaries, I mean, the level of dedication that they've had to what they've done sometimes has just been absolutely remarkable. I, I've heard their stories. I've known some of them. I, I don't know if I could have done what some of those people did, but um, uh, Mark Alley uh, uh, did, did that. And then 30 years ago, he became an uh, employee of the Christianity Today, and for about the last decade, has served as its editor-in-chief. And so he is the person whose name is on the masthead of that article about impeachment. A lot of people who didn't know better just blew their top over that. A lot of people who should have known better just blew their top over that. Because if they would have gone back and simply looked, which many people don't, of course, they would have found out that in 1974 that the Christian Century had a major article in which they talked about the impeachment of Richard Nixon. If people had gone back and looked, which they don't always, they would have found out in 1998 that Christian Century had a major article about the impeachment of Bill Clinton. And so uh, the articles were designed to try to talk to a readership about something that was a current issue of, 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 of the day. Uh, something that Billy Graham never drew back from, if you can remember Billy Graham. He was as contemporary about events of the day as anyone could be. When he started Christian Century, uh, Billy Graham said very specifically, I want to stake the flag of American evangelical faith right in the middle of the road. He said, I do not want to lean to the right and be an ultra-conservative. 
And I do not want to lean to the left and be an ultra-liberal. I want to stake the flag of American evangelical faith right in the middle of the road where we can perhaps pull these people together that are at opposite ends of theological and religious kinds of perspectives. He said, I believe that religion should be conservative and this magazine will be conservative. And he said, I believe that religion should also be very liberal in terms of its social activities and what it does to help and care for people. And he wanted his magazine to have uh, that focus. So I, I think that fits in our class really well. I, I think that we are kind of a, a, a middle of the road class. Uh, we may be getting old and lame too, but we're kind of a middle of the road class. And so clearly there are people in here that are very conservative and there are people in here that aren't as conservative. And, we find a way to come together and to love each other and then even more especially we find a way to become involved in social issues like the care of underprivileged children in this community and what we do for their lives that's one of the most remarkable stories of this class and of this church in its history and so I, I think that Billy Graham would be really really happy uh, to see how this class functions and how this class acts on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And so Mark Galley writes an article that is pretty much like an article that was written in relationship to two former American presidents. The, the only difference is that on Friday of this week, uh, Mark Galley was fired. And so he's totally out the door of being able to do what he's done in a, in a very calling sort of way for 30 years of his life. So the world has changed that we live in. Now then, here's where I want the lesson to go. <clears throat> when, when Mark Galley talks about himself, he describes his Christianity as being a very, very specific kind of Christianity. When he talks about himself and the way that he follows Jesus, he believes, in his life, he uses a very, very specific word. And that's what I want you to go away with today. You'll be tested on this next week. <laughs> he describes himself as an ironic Christian. I-R-E-N-I-C. An ironic Christian. Now, I've had people in my family that would be ironic Christians, I guess, but that's not the word I'm talking about. I'm talking about an ironic Christian. Everybody got that? Okay, uh, if you study New Testament Greek, you immediately know what that means. The word irene is the New Testament Greek word for peace. For peace. And so Mark Alley says, that the number one call of Jesus Christ to our lives is to live with each other in peace with the kind of love that Jesus taught us and the kind of love that Jesus exemplified in his life. That the first thing that we've got to do if we're truly Christian is we've got to be able to figure out how we can advance peace between people as opposed to division between people and separation between people, we've got to show the world that in the love of Jesus Christ, people can bring their lives together in terms of love, in terms of mercy, in terms of care, in terms of division, in, in, in terms of overcoming divisions. An ironic Christian. I hadn't thought about that an awfully lot. I've used that word in a lot of stuff. Um, but I think that's kind of what I've decided. I've decided that uh, I want to be an ironic Christian. I want to be somebody that promotes peace based on the kind of love that Jesus says that we've got to manifest with each other. And I think I believe that if we can't do that as individuals, then most everything else we do is just empty words. That if we can't do that as churches of people, then we will absolutely lose our relevance as far as the world is concerned and coming generations are concerned. Uh, the Bible clearly tells us that Satan is the author of division. That is the task of Satan to keep us separated from each other in every way that we possibly can. 
once a little erosion and niche of separation begins to occur, then before you know it, there's a landslide of separation and people are at each other in ways that manifest little if nothing about Jesus. And so I think that our rank Christians would be wanting to try to heal the divisions that we see in this country between people politically. I think that Iranic Christians would be trying to heal the divisions that exist in this country between different philosophies and different theolog theologies of life that we have. If, if we can't come to the place where we are at peace with each other and that that peace is driven by the love of Jesus Christ, then I think that a, a lot of whatever else we do as churches and as supposed Christians is just going to be a bunch of empty in, in balderdash. That we've got to be able to find peace that is born of the love of Christ. I, I even still think that the United Methodist Church has a good opportunity to do something about that and to be an example of that for the rest of the world. I think that we've still got an opportunity not to go down some of the paths that it looks like we're maybe going down. Because I stand up here and tell you with all my heart, if we go down some of the paths that are out there today, then any credibility and relevance that we have for coming generations in this country and in this world is going to take a hit that I don't personally believe that we're going to be able to come back from or to overcome. We have got to figure out how to first be at peace with each other. We've got to first understand that the high mandate of Jesus Christ is for us to love each other and that there are no exceptions to that. There are no second-hand ways of doing that. There's only a first-hand way of being a follower of Jesus Christ and that is to be people who are at peace with each other and who love each other in the way that Jesus would love. We need to be ironic Christians who put peace based on the love of Jesus Christ in front of every, everything else, and there is no exception to that. That's kind of what Mark Galley says about his own faith. Uh, and when that kind of faith gets you fired, the leading evangelical publication in the United States. What is that to say? All right. I have with me this morning an article that came into my possession not long ago. Uh, Bishop Looney and I are president and vice president of something called the Rem Edwards Fan Club. Uh, Rem Edwards taught at the United, uh, uh, taught at the University of Tennessee for most all of his academic career. Ordained Methodist minister. Started off as a young man uh, coming out of uh, Emory and preaching in Methodist churches. Uh, he goes to uh, Broad Street in, in Knoxville and that's where he got to sit under the preaching of Bishop Looney. And, 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 and he said, Bishop, that uh, in, in the years of his adult life that the preaching that you brought to that church was the best it may have ever had. And that you had touched lives right and left, including his own. And so Rem directed my doctoral dissertation and was one of my major professors, and that's how I got to know him and, and, and care for him deeply. Uh, and although he has become, across his adult life, a, a, a philosopher of huge note, He's never got away from two things. He's never got away from writing about John Wesley. And he's never gotten away from putting John Wesley at the centerpiece of his teachings and his writings that he has become very well known for across the last two or three decades. And so although he is retired now, he, he's still writing about John Wesley. And I think he may have become, in the meantime, maybe the most important modern Wesleyan scholar that there is out there. And so what I've got here in front of me is I've got uh, uh, Rem Edwards' latest article on John Wesley. And so I, I want to read you about three or four little sections from that where he quotes, not me or the bishop, or not somebody in a magazine, but where he <laughs> quotes John Wesley. 
And maybe John Wesley was the original Iranic preacher. Maybe what we've been talking about, about peace between people driven by the love of God, maybe that is more at the core of our faith as Methodists than we might ever could imagine. And so let me very pointedly read two or three quotes, not from somebody out there on the modern edge of religious controversy or conversation, but from John Wesley, who you've heard me say many times that I'm convinced is the most important Protestant uh, religious figure of the Reformation and whole Reformation uh, period. Uh, I think if anybody got it right, it was John Wesley. Listen to this. Let it be John Wesley speaking. These are direct quotes from him. Wesley said, Orthodoxy or right opinions. Isn't that interesting? That he would say that orthodoxy is an opinion. An opinion. That orthodoxy is an opinion that is considered right by probably a lot of people at a particular time in the evolution of faith history. But orthodoxy is an opinion. And at best, at best, should be a slender part of religion if it can be allowed to be a part at all. In a later writing that Rem Edwards quotes from, John, uh, John Wesley announces orthodoxy is at best, but a slender part of religion, if it can be allowed to be any part at all. Isn't that an amazing statement? I mean, just let that sink in for a day or two with you. That all of the things that we would say have come to constitute what people believe is orthodox religious belief and thought that everything that we come up with and branded as orthodoxy in one church or one tradition or one set of ideas or one preacher or one theologian or another, that orthodoxy is but a slender part of religious faith even if it should be allowed in at all. That's not Steve, and that's not Al, and that's not the bishop. That's John Wesley. People can be real Christians, Wesley thought, without mentally comprehending, believing, or affirming many, perhaps not any, of the fundamental doctrines of Christian orthodoxy previously identified, in, including the ideas of Christianity that have been passed down from the church. A person can be a real Christian without mentally comprehending, believing, or affirming many items that have become orthodoxy. True religion, real Christianity, and authentic Methodism. Hmm. Real Christianity, true religion, authentic Methodism. Wesley thought was not primarily a matter of the head. They're chiefly matters of the heart, of love, and of all the tempers, affections, virtues, actions, gifts, beliefs, practices, and devotion that constitute an issue from love. Wesley affirmed Christianity not as it implies a set of opinions or a set of doctrines, but as it refers to men's hearts and their lives. Got one more. This is John Wesley. I believe the merciful God regards the lives and tempers of men more than their ideas. I believe the res its respect the goodness of the heart rather than the clearness of the head. 
I believe it respects the goodness of the heart rather than the clearness of the head. And that if the heart of man is filled by the grace of God and the power of His Spirit with the humble, gentle, patient love of God and man, God will not cast him into everlasting fire prepared for the devils and his angels because his ideas are not clear or because his conceptions may be by some measure confused. Okay. What did Wesley come out for if this lets us know what Wesley was against? What Wesley came out for is one of the most important statements he ever made in all his writings of life. Wesley talked about the sum of all. The sum of all. And he meant by that at the end of the day, what is the summation of all that we call faith? At the end of the day, what is the summative pinnacle of all that we call faith? And it was not about some political difference. And it was not about some theological difference. And it was not about some lifestyle difference. Wesley said, the sum of all is easy. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Wesley said, that's what it is all about and that is the sum of it all. Love God, love our neighbors, and love ourselves. Love God, love our neighbors, and love ourselves. And let flow out from that a mandate to be at peace with each other. A mandate to live in love with each other. A mandate to rid ourselves of the separations that so easily divide us. We live in a divided country. And the word of Jesus to that divided country is blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. We live in a divided church. And the message of Jesus to that church is blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children. I don't know about you. I want kind of the epitaph on my life to be that I was a child of God. And I mean that very seriously. I want to feel like that somewhere down the road my grandchildren's grandchildren can look back on my life and say, he was a child of God. I'd like to think that if we show up at some pearly gate at some point in the future, that somebody's going to be standing there saying, come on in, this is a child of God. And Jesus is unequivocal. Jesus says we're children of God if we're peacemakers. If we're authors of unity and not division. If we find out how we can be in this world with people, as opposed to exiting them from our wars. So much of our country's political life today is based upon opinion. And so much of our religious life, even in our wonderful, can we still call it, United Methodist Church, is based on opinion. John Wesley said, opinion is at best a slight fragment of faith and it may not even be a part of it at all. That what we must be is people who live together with the love of Christ motivating the decisions and actions of our lives and finding a unity that will sustain us to His kingdom. Blessed are the peacemakers, the ironic Christians, for they will be called the children of God. What do I want to be called? What do you want to be called? 
Only one way. By letting the peace of God that passes all understanding emanate from our lives and drive our decisions in a way that we live with each other. It's beyond understanding. It's the power of God acting in our lives to create His kingdom. His kingdom is divided. His kingdom threatens to be even more divided. And we're called upon to be makers of peace born of the love of God manifested in Jesus Christ. There's no other way to be His children. Let's pray. Forgive us, our Father, when we allow the thoughts of human beings to be more important than the thoughts of Your Son and His Word. Forgive us, our Father, when we find ways to separate ourselves from each other, sometimes with great aggressiveness and great anger. Great anger. Help us to know that's not the pathway to being Your children. Help us that we might find ways to get beyond human opinions and find the peace that comes from following the love of God. Help our nation with all of its divisions. Help our world with all of its divisions. Help our church even with its divisions. For we're called upon to be a light to the world. Help us that that light might be bright with your kind of love. For we ask in Jesus' name that Jesus who showed us the way. Amen. Thank you all for coming today. Reggie, we have anything else?